Okay, class dismissed. Oh, wait, I did it in reverse. Darn. Welcome to our first endgame class of the year, but not our last, right? Okay, so uh, today we have a special endgame class because everybody's favorite endgame player is... Me. Correct. However, when I first asked that question, I was talking to Anatoly Karpov, and he gave the same answer as you. Therefore, we're going to talk about Karpov. Okay, your favorite player. Now... Uh, a funny story before we look at the games. When I was first at the St. Louis Chess Club, before you were all born, two, uh, January 2010, we were talking about Anatoly Karpov, and one of the pre people who ran the chess club said, who's that? You know, they don't say that anymore, but they used to say that. Okay. So then you learn who people are, and then you know who they are. Yeah. Okay. Karpov was known for his endgame technique, and Kasparov was not. Kasparov was known for... 30 moves of opening preparation, and then sack all his pieces and mate you. So their games were interesting. Like either Karbov got mated or he won 90 move end games. So, okay. And as you know, in the first world championship match they played, what was the score after 29 games? Tied. You, you weren't alive in 1984? Nah. Pfft, horrible. The correct answer, you'll fall out of your chair when I tell you, so sit straight. Karpov, five wins to zero, 24 draws. So not tied. And what happened? How'd that match end? Who knows? Kasparov won. No. You can't guess how it ended if you don't know. The match did not end. Oh. Did you, you guys don't know any of this? Mm -hmm. It was the most the biggest scandal in chess history, but nobody knows it. Oh, I guess the new scandals have come up. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what happened was, after they played 48 or 49 games over six months... Okay, and the president of the World Chess Federation stopped the match and said it's canceled. They said the players are too tired. Very suspicious. Karpov was up five games to zero, and the next 20 games, Kasparov won three to zero, so it was five to three. It's the first to win six. So it's five to three with 40 draws. And he's like, everybody's tired, the match is over. Now, this doesn't make any sense because Kasparov won the last two games. So you can't say he's too tired. He's winning game after game. You know, ridiculous. That was a big scandal. Then the next year, of course, Kasparov won and became world champion. And now you've heard of Kasparov. If Kasparov lost 6-0, maybe you wouldn't have heard of Kasparov. Because maybe he would have been like, I guess chess isn't for me. Yeah. Okay. So this is from their first match when Karpov was Karpov. Now he's, you know, older. And here, who has the advantage, white or black? Very easy to tell because of who the lecture is on. White. White. Okay, but more importantly, why is white better? There's actually an actual reason. Everything looks pretty symmetrical. So what's good about white's position? Who knows the answer? Anybody? White has an active rook on a5. I like white's rook on a5 better than black's rooks. Agreed. Uh, he's putting pressure on the c5 pawn. On the indefensible c5 pawn. So even though the pawn structure is symmetrical, this pawn can't be defended, and this pawn can't be attacked. So I'm going to win your c5 pawn. You're not going to win my c4 pawn, right? Because c4 is? Explosive. Explosive. You even come to my lectures enough. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, what's funny is I didn't show you this because, you know, you didn't need to, just needed no basis. The last five moves, White could have played knight c5, but he's like, I don't have to do that. I can do what I want. I'll take c5 when I feel like it. But since the lecture is starting here, now he felt like it. Okay. And they traded knights. And rook d6. Otherwise, rook takes bishop is good for white. Okay, how do we win such endgames? Nobody knows. You know who does know? Anatoly Karpov. Anatoly Karpov. What school did he go to? Old school. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> even in 84. Now, what's funny about that is, in previous world championship matches, the de facto won in 74, not de jure. In 78 and 81, he played against... Same guy three times. I know this. Only two of them were for the world change. The other one happened to be Korshnoi. Very good. And Korshnoi was old school. He was like 20 years older than Karpov. So they played world championship matches, and there was like an older guy versus a young guy. Now, in 74, as you know, um, they played a match, and it was the winner would play the world champion, which was in 74. supposed to be. It was. It was Fisher. Fisher was world champion in 74. So whoever won Karpov-Korshnoi played Fisher. 
Now, Fisher wasn't going to play, and everybody sort of knew that, because Fisher hadn't played one game since he played Spassky. So it wasn't like he was likely to play. So whoever won Korshnoi Karpov was going to become the world champion. Karpov, I think, won three games to two with 1,000 draws. Then Fisher, did, then Fisher didn't play, so Karpov was world champion. Then he played two real matches with Korshnoi, and you know the scores of those matches, I have to tell you. Well, the second match at 81, he won six games to two. The first match in 78, also the second match, it's the first and the second, okay, you understand why, is because is the match score was five games to two, sounds good, and Korshner won three games in a row. So it's five to five. And then in game 32, I believe, I believe, then Karpov won with White and Appearance, resigned at, at, at adjournment. So six games to five. From five to two lead. Then next match, SmackDown, then Korshnoi's too old. Okay. But here, Karpov, 84. How old's Karpov at 84? 33, right? Oh, it's Yeah, 33. So that's pretty, at, at this time, that's like the peak. Now it's like 23, but 84 was 33. Okay. And so Karpov played King E2, because what would I say? Activate your king. Activate your king. Okay, that stops the black rook from coming in. And then king e7, same reason. Rook to d1. Now, in these positions, grandmasters try to trick you lower-rated players. And you two at home, pay attention. What they do is, is they say, in these positions, you want to trade rooks or you're done, but they don't tell you why. Okay, so obviously white wants to trade rooks because Karpov played rook d1. But if you're playing the game, are you like, hmm, what do I do? Okay, and here, you want to trade rooks because the rook on c1 does nothing. And potentially, black could get counterplay because white's king isn't really safe. White doesn't have like, you know, white, white's got rook d2 coming. The seventh rank is open. Uh, this rook isn't going anywhere. So if eventually black doubled rooks, he would get counterplay with his rooks. If there's one rook, the white king can stop the one rook. And Karpov's school of chess is stop counterplay. Most people who are low rated, like all of you, are like, what am I going to do? I'll do this. And Karpov's higher rated than you. He says, what is my opponent going to do? I'm going to stop them. Because Sparov obviously likes active play, so he's going to try to get active and get compensation for his pawn. So you could argue, trade, trade, trade when you're ahead, which I wouldn't argue, but you could argue it here. Because if White's king was like on G2, and there was a pawn on F2, you'd be like, that's the safest king ever, although there'd be a bishop here. But here, with the rooks on the board, this king get in trouble. Okay, so rook d1, trade, king d6, activate the king, roar. And the rook is trapped, so he resigned. Oh, dang. Right. Okay, rook a5. Yeah. f5. And then we discussed this in previous endgame classes, but none of you were here. Although maybe you were here. And you at home were here. Roar. Why didn't you donate money yet at home? That's right. You do it now, I'll wait. No, 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 go on, go. No, pause the video. Okay, you've donated, we can continue. Now, in these positions we've discussed previously, who's trying to win, white or black? White. White, who's trying to draw? Black. black. When you're trying to draw, and it's an end game, what do you want to do pawn-wise? Trying to draw. Trade. Trade all the pawns. If it's rook and bishop against rook and bishop, it's a draw. If it's rook, bishop, and pawn versus rook and bishop, it's a draw. If there's a lot of pawns, then it's probably not a draw. And the reason it's a draw, well, it's hard to queen one pawn. If you have seven pawns or six pawns, it's hard to stop them all. And particularly in this ending, if black gets lucky and trades all the pawns and white's still a pawn up, he could sacrifice his bishop and get rook and bishop versus rook, which is a book draw. Not that he would draw, but probably he would. So f5... Brings the pawns closer together, more likely there'll be some trades. And again, space. Okay, white's move is obvious. Don't have to ask the class. Activate your king. And then he plays the move e4. Now, we're going to go back. In this position, this pawn is defending this pawn, and none of you care about that. You're like, that pawn's not attacked. Okay, but there is a rook on the same line. And in all of my classes, endgame or not, we talked about pieces lined up. Now, one of my favorite chess teachers is sitting right over there. I think her name's Karen Boyd. And Karen today was playing chess and after you left. And then she was given the smackdown. 
And she had a rook on e8. I'm sure she remembers this well. And her opponent had a queen on e3 and a king on e1. So Karen's like foaming at the mouth. And the kid didn't care. He just moved his queen, you know, left his king in check. And Karen's like, your king's in check. You can't do that. So now the kid realizes he's going to lose his queen. And Karen explained to him, when the king and queen and rook are lined up, you got to watch that. That's, you know, you got to avoid that. So when things are lined up, okay, you have to avoid that because then bad stuff happens. This rook is lined up with all of black's pawns. All of black's pawns are protected, so nobody cares. And Kasparov was like, rawr, I'm Kasparov, rawr. Kasparov was really young in 84. Let's see who knows. Should I give you credit? You just like said it really quickly, too. He's born in 63. So, yeah, so 21, yeah. But you said it really fast, yeah. So Kasparov's 21. He's like, rawr, h5, rawr. And Karpov's like, oh, this pawn's not defended. This pawn's not defended. And my rook is on the same line. And Karpov's, and Kasparov's like, you can't talk during the game. And Karpov's like, I'm the world champion. He's like, oh, I apologize. <laughs> and that, that all happened. That's a true story. Based on a true story. So Karpov played e4. He's like, hey, let me take all of your pawns. And Kasparov's like, no problem. I sacrifice pawns all the time. No, he didn't say that. He's like, darn, e4. My pawns are all hanging. Okay, takes, 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 takes. So we traded pawns, but now black has three isolated pawns, and my rook is even better. And I have a two-to-one majority here, a potential passed pawn, and I have a passed pawn. I'm not really worried about this passed pawn because I have a king here. So I'm not worried. And as you pointed out earlier, white's rook is better. Black's rook is like, what am I doing over here? So by creating pass pawns on both sides of the board, that's the way to win. Not one pass pawn, the guy blocks it. Okay, bishop f5, trapping the rook. Now most of you would take that h pawn, but if you're playing Kasparov, it might be a poison pawn, right? And I'm a vegan, so everything's poisonous, right? So what's wrong with rook h5? Should we call on Christy? Because she likes when I call on her. Man, you should see him. You should see your faces. One's this and one's this. <laughs> yeah, and then he's like, mm hmm. Yeah. So after rook takes h5, which was not played, remember I said lined up and I did all that? The safety dance? We, yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, don't sue me, whoever you are. Men without hats? And you have a hat. I have a hat. Yeah. Good dogs. You have a 0% chance of hearing of the group men without hats. That's your percentage. You've heard of them. Never heard of them. Yeah, you had a 0% chance. Uh, out of you and Christy, one of two of you have heard of them. And you haven't, right? And then Karen's heard of them. Yes, I knew everybody who... Heard, I didn't know which one I just knew one of two. Yeah, okay. So so when the pieces are lined up, what does black do? You see how these are lined up? So what does black do about that? What, what's that? See, they're lined up diagonally. You see the... So what does he do? Who? You didn't tell her the answer? What, who, what? Bishop G4, and that's better for black. And Karpov's so good, no, it wouldn't matter. Okay, I'll tell you a funny story about that where I think almost everybody's gonna laugh, but it's a true story, it's true. Okay, so in my life, two or three times, very funny things have happened which remind me of each other, which Karen won't see the similarity, but I'll, I'll try to explain it. So first I'll tell you the one that didn't happen to me, then I'll tell you the one that did. In England, the first time I was there, uh, it was in 1986, I was playing in a tournament, and there was a reporter who showed up, not, not a chess player. And the reporter said to one of the players in the tournament, if you were playing, and it was 86, and they said Kasparov, if you were playing Kasparov and you were up a queen and a rook and a knight, how would you do? And the guy's like 2,400. He's like, well, I'd win. Then he's like, no, you wouldn't. You don't realize how strong the world champion is. Okay, it's sort of like here I was going to make a joke like after losing the rook. Okay. <laughs> now that reminds me of a funny situation in my life. When I was a kid, unfortunately, I saw the Godfather movies. Now I can't understand them because I'm a kid. I was probably like 11. And I'm watching. It was great. I love them now. And I'm watching the movie. And I was very confused about one thing. So in one of the movies, nobody knows which movie is which. Al Pacino, Al Pacino? Yeah, he has to go, he's got to go back to the old country because they're going to kill him. He hangs out there for about a year. And he meets the guy who, like, killed his family when he was a little kid. So now, okay. So during the movie, I would ask questions. I'm a kid, and I'm like, who's that guy? 
And then my dad's like, that's the guy who runs like the Italian mafia. Like, this guy's the biggest guy. And then Al Pacino just kills him like instantly. And I was like, well, how could you kill that guy? He's the head. Like, you can't, he, he's tough. Like, he's an old guy. But I mean, I thought if you were the head and you were tough, you, you can't be killed. Like, a bullet wouldn't kill you. And my dad's like, well, he shot him with a gun. Like, and I was like, what? But he's such a tough guy. I didn't realize. Like, he's the head, so he's, you can't do anything to him. So this happens in chess, too. So, like, if I spot you a queen, you might win, but not in the chess camp. I spotted them a queen, although one kid did beat me. So the point is, if you blunder, you lose. I don't care what your rating is. Okay, and I'll tell you one last story, and then I'll forget what I'm talking about. Uh, the most famous bridge player of all time is Barry Crane. Very famous. And he was playing against what we call little old ladies, you know, suspicious women who are old and play bridge. <laughs> and at one point, he did something, and the woman took out a bidding card that doubled the stakes. Like, insult, like an insult. Like, that's no good. And, the, and he looked at her and says, ma'am, do you know how many, high car, how many master points I have? He had the most master points in the world, like the highest rating. And she said, no, but I know how many cards I, I know what's in my hand. I don't know who you are, but I know what I got. Right, and so she showed him. She's like, I don't know who you are. Best bridge player in the world. Never heard of you, but I'm gonna, I'm crushing you. <laughs> right. If you're up a lot of pieces, I don't care what you do. Right. You have to do the smackdown. So here, after bishop f5, obviously, frankly, can't take that pawn. Okay. King e3, and this is a very important thing to learn. I wish I learned it about five years ago, because about four years ago, I bundled a rook. I had my king and rook on white squares or black squares, and my opponent had the bishop, and he, and he got me. Now, if this bishop's on a white square, which is now a red square, okay, because the players are Russian. Thank you. You got it, right? Okay, good. Okay. Red square, Russian. What? He still doesn't get it. He who laughs last didn't get it. Yeah. How'd you get your 15? You don't know anything. I don't know anything. Yeah. You don't even get it, do you? I thought it was a relation like the commies. Like yeah, red square. Yeah. yeah. No, nothing. All right. Okay, so the point is, when the bishop's on a white square and your pieces are on dark squares, the bishop ain't going to do nothing to him, right? So king e3. In fact, I was taken aback. I just didn't say anything because it's Karpov. I was taken aback in this position that Karpov played king e2. I didn't say anything because I'm, you know, I'm trying to move the lecture along. I never pause and give a funny story. Okay, because <laughs> he's like, what the... Okay, so... Like, I thought king d2, because that's much safer than the king on e2, because it's a white-squared bishop. But Karpov saw this coming, because that's on the same line. Remember the same? Yeah. So king e2, like, protects f3. So that's making the bishop less, you know, strong. Okay. So king e3, obviously. h4, because the pawn was hanging now, for real. Now, this is something that confuses the audience. When somebody can't do something... Like, you can't play rook takes h5, as we discussed. Well, this move, you can't play rook takes h5. You might not notice. You're like, I still can't play it. And then you're like, oh, he can play it. Then the game would really be resignable if you lose your h pawn. So h4. Okay. King d4, because Karpov's like, move your king up. Ben said so. And I was alive during this game. So, got to move your king up. In fact, this was in November of 84. In fact, this was played on your birthday. Remember your birthday in 84? Remember what happened? Yeah. Okay. So uh, earlier in the year, I was at Red Square. I was in Moscow when I was 14. And we talked about the match. And they said, yeah, Karpov was pretty good. So yeah. people thought Karpov would win in, in Russia because Karpov. Yeah. Okay. Now they wouldn't think that. Okay, now King D4 is a weird move because you guys are all screaming for black to play. Make sure you scream. Right. Okay, and he did play e5. Now, e5 is like, yay, it's check. You're like so happy, right? You've never been so happy to check your opponent. And you have a pass pawn, you're queening it. What's the negative of e5? Why is that bad? It drops f5. Yeah, the f5 bishop is not protected anymore. Now you got to do something about that. Okay, so he played e5. Otherwise, the white king on d4. c5 check. Rawr. Okay. King c3. Defending everything. Everything's super defended. Okay, and now bishop to b1. Now, Karpov's next move, when I was looking at the game earlier, I was like, what? I understand it now, but it took me a long time. 
Very hard move for anybody to play. But basically, there's something called tied down. Wow, I can't make any of my jokes. Darn. How old are you again? 15. Damn. Okay, when you're 16, come back. I'll make some jokes. Okay, so this pawn's on a2. So the bishop... What's that? In six days, you're 16? Yeah. Happy birthday. So the bishop's protecting the pawn because I said so, and this bishop's attacking the pawn. That means if the bishop moves away, the pawn is hanging, so the bishop on b3 is tied down, but not after Karpov's move. a3. I'm like, a3? Why do you play a3? I'm like, oh, okay, now the bishop can you know, saunter away. Okay. Rook e7, and you can put your rook behind the pass pawn. You've all heard that before. No? Yeah. Well, you have now. <laughs> rook g4, threatening the pawn. How do you save the pawn? Man, rook h7, terrible. I want your rook there. Yeah. yeah. h3. Okay, he wants to give white doubled isolated pawns, especially when it's the wrong color of the bishop. Right? Then if you can get rid of these guys, very good drawing chances. So Karpov played g3. He wants two connected pass pawns. Rook e8. Why did he play rook e8? Good question. Because I don't think that works on a7. Oh, I figured out why just looking at it now. So black wants to activate his rook. Rawr. Right? How do we do that? Rook f7. Yeah, you want to go to the f file because there's no other way to do it. Yeah. See the open f file? So if you could play rook f2 and rook h2, that would be good. But rook f7 loses to c5 check. And you're putting your rook on the same diagonal as the bishop. So don't do that. So rook e8. With the idea of rook f8, rook f2, rook h2, black wins. Okay, rook g7, threatening a pawn. Rook f8, ignoring it. Karpov's like, thanks. And rook f2, as I explained in the class. Because Karpov, Kasparov's like, you can take this pawn, I'm taking this pawn, and I'm going to make a queen. Now, Karpov has three passed pawns. That's a lot of passed pawns. Mm -hmm. right. So king b4, because it... Activate the, Activate the king, and now we can help our pawn go, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, takes, c5 check. This move you can find. Not like, maybe like half the kids in the camp could, but all of you could. King. Man, in the camp, anything is possible here. Anything. Mm -hmm. King takes pawn, rook, rook g1. Rook g1 was funny. I made a super illegal move. Yeah, actually, if black could put white in shack, that would be recommended in the Carlson game. Okay, king c6, obviously, frankly. Bishop a4, only legal move. Rook check, forcing the king away from the pawn. And here comes the pawn. Now, most of you would go back here because it pretends to attack the rook, but it doesn't. Rook's protected. And you move your king up in the end game because I said so. Then c6. Rook b2 check. Man, that pawn's pretty quick. Rook b2. Move your king up in the end game. I know you'd move it back because nobody listens to me, but move it up. The pawn's going to go to c7, and then you're going to use your king, and everybody's going to be happy. Well, white is. Why not c5? King to c5 here? Yeah. King c5's okay. It's a little more exposed on c5. Well, a5 is the safest king I've ever seen. But isn't the idea still the same to get a b6? No, king c5 I think is equally good. Okay. Gotta go somewhere. Yeah. Now, he was white. I'm the only chess teacher in the world that would point this out. Ever. Even after I said nobody will ever point it out. But I'm right. Although I'm like kidding, but I'm still right. I'm still right. He's white, so the clock's on his left. Mm. Nobody gets it? Nobody well, if you play king c5 and then move your hand to the left, or king a5 to the left, you save time by playing king a5. Because the clock's there. If he was black, then king c5 clocks to the right. So that, yeah, king a5. You guys don't play a lot of blitz chess, do you? I play a lot. No, you, you should learn these tricks. Like move near the clock when you have one second on your clock. By the way, the most famous blitz game ever played between Anna Zatonsky and Raina Crush. Really? None of you know what I'm talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. They played a blitz game for the U.S. Women's Championship, and there was no delay, no increment, and they both had no time at the end. And Anna just moved near the clock. She played like rookie, and she just did this, and Irina was playing real moves. And Irina lost on time, and Anna had one second left. And it decided the U.S. Women's Championship. 
they, they changed the format to have like increment and delay because that's ridiculous. Yeah. So king a5 towards the clock. Genius. Increment and oh. delay. Well, one of them. One or the other. Now, on Futurama, they're on the moon, and the guy's like, it gets pretty cold here on the moon. And he's like, how cold? And he says, 40 below zero. And he says, Fahrenheit or Celsius? Which is a joke because it's the same. And he says, first one, then the other. That's a funny answer. Right. That's, that's sort of like here now, by the way, for you people at home. It's about 40 below zero here in Atlanta. Yeah, it's harsh around here. Yeah. Not from Michigan. Okay. So rook b8, because the pawn's going to queen, and you can't play rook c2 because the, it's hanging. So you got to, whoa. So you got to stop it somehow. C7, rook c8. White plays the obvious move. King B6. Now your move is looking good. The move that you were going to say before? H2. I thought you were going to say Rook A D8. Yeah. yeah. Okay, King here. Now if you play H2 and I play Rook H7, I think you're going to lose your pawn. Oh, that's a fact. Yeah. So if you play King here and your bishop is protecting H7, now you're serious. Mm -hmm. That's the serious seriousness. Notice how he moves his king to a dark square. So why can't check and gain a tempo? Like Bishop C6, check Bishop B7. Or if your king's on f3, because you guys like attacking pawns, now if you try to queen your pawns on that bishop c6 check, terrible. Okay. Bishop c6, two for one, stopping your pawn, and bishop b7's the threat. h2 anyway. Uh, now you have to stop that h pawn, so it's h2, whoa, stop that pawn. All right, one person out of four gets it. All right. G4. Now, G4 is a move I would never think of, but Karpov's like, all right, I stopped this pawn, I got this pawn, I have another pawn. Why not play? As they would say in Tombstone, I got two guns, one for each of you. No, nothing. nothing. Worst audience ever. Okay, so what, what was your question? Uh, is it pushing A4 okay? A4 and G4, same, same kind of ideas. Right. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. Interesting. Okay, g4. g4 has the added benefit of stopping bishop f5. So, like, after rook d8, I assume bishop f5. But now I don't assume bishop f5. Okay, and again, grandmasters and world champions, they figure out what their opponent's going to do and they stop it. Bishop f5, that's a good score for the black bishop. But not anymore. Okay. Rook h8. He wants to queen too. Who doesn't want a queen? Rook d1. He's like, now you're not going to queen. Now, why can't I play rook d8? What's wrong with me? Why am I so weak? Oh, probably rook h6. Then promote. Then I promote. And then I can't take. Yeah. Yeah, Karpov's good. He sees all the tricks. Yeah, so if rook d8, the obvious move, rook here, pinning the bishop, and now I'm threatening that. Although then I could play rig d1. Well, then you play bishop e4. Man, I'm too old for this position. Yeah, that's too complicated for me. Okay, so Karpov played the simplest move, rig d1, stopping everything, right? Because basically, in this position, white wins, unless black's h-pawn is good, and after rig d1, the h-pawn's no good. What about bishop e4 and trading? Oh, but they just go rig h1. Bishop e4, trade. Black oh, yeah, then what you said was right. I thought rookie one check was good, but I'm not sure if it is. I'm too old. Oh, yeah, rookie but it might not be good. Six piece, no. Six. Well, I'm queening. Your rook's blocking your bishop. Okay. But it is good, because I sack my rook and take your queen. Mm -hmm. But we're too old for that. Yeah, that's too complicated. Karpov's not doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, bishop a2. Somebody explain why he did it. Close the corner. Funny. See, that was just like a one-time joke. Now it's every move. I mean, it's obvious why he did it. Come on. Really? Oh, bishop e6. Yeah, white's get a queen, so bishop e6. Yeah. See, that's... Uh, see? You couldn't play here because he stopped it, so you go here. Okay. Rook check. King has to move. Now, if the king goes up, we take the pawn and stop bishop e6. So you got to defend that pawn. Check. Now it's hard to defend the pawn. You have to cheat. Okay, but he didn't cheat. Takes. Man, Karpov took that pawn. 
Man, this is the truth hurts. King takes pawn. Rook e2. Rook e2 is really nice. I like that move the most. He's threatening everything. No? Yeah. So white got his king active. White got his past pawn active. White took all the pawns black had. And now white's taking the pawn next move. You can't play bishop e6, stopping the pawn, because my rook's here. You don't want me to take your bishop. If you move your bishop, I'm going to take your h-pawn, because the rook is, what's the chess term? Overloaded. Yeah, overloaded or overworked. Yeah. So now it's going to say plus a billion, so Kasparov resigned. And then plus a billion, I was right. Yeah, I wasn't kidding when I said plus a billion. And I did look before, but I know. I know plus a billion when I see it. Uh, H1 bishop, the best move. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I like that game because in the beginning of the game, Karpov had this past C pawn that had 20 black pieces in front of it. Then a lot of stuff happened, and they pushed the C pawn. Yeah, he distracted Black's king away from the C pawn. The C pawn was strong. Yeah. Okay, so that was a very tough game, the toughest by far. Now, this is really cool because I don't know this game. Now, Robert Hubner, as you know, is one of the world's leading papriologists. Exactly. Who will explain what that is? Anybody? English major? Yeah. Okay. He takes unknown languages and makes them known. So I can't say what I want to say, but if you see the scene in Adaptation where the guy's on the stand, I want to say that about him. If you remember that scene. He's a smart something. Okay. Anyway, Humner doesn't play chess for a living. He does his other thing, and then he plays chess occasionally, and he was top ten in the world forever. Now, one of the top universities in the U.S. for that is University of Michigan. And Hubner lived in Michigan for two years as a residing scholar. And then he actually played chess in Chicago and gave people the smackdown because Hubner's good. And Hubner was good in 82. Wow, Hubner in 82. Yeah. Old school. Okay. In 82, he's like Karpov's age. So the same age. They're both like 30. He's still alive today. Yeah. Okay. So in this position, this is very strange. Because black took a rook, which means Karpov sacrificed a rook for a mating attack. What? Okay, first of all, it's Karpov. Second of all, it's an game lecture. What world am I in? Okay, well, Trump's the president. That's the world I'm in. Okay, now, after, now I've been teaching for years and years and years and years two very important concepts. Knife F5 and never play. Never play F5. <laughs> Can you like, we retake this scene? Never play. What did Black play? It's obvious what Black played here. You, yeah, you have to stop F6. You have to play, stop Queen G7, mate. It's mate. Okay, so White played my favorite move, and Black played my least favorite move. So I wonder who won. Black. Close. Now, notice that Black, Black is up a rook. Did you notice that? No. Yeah. So what did Karpov do? Did he trade queens? No. No. So he played for a mating attack in an endgame lecture class. Mm -hmm. no. no. Queen d5 check. Yeah. Now, I have a rule never trade. Okay, this is not a trade. This is the queens came off the board and this c pawn became a monster. That's not a trade. That's your C pawn queening. Yeah. And he has to take. Yeah. And even though White's down a rook, White's winning because of his pawns. And as you've all heard before, well, you have home have heard. What, what is the mathematical equation for these two things? You've, there's a saying about it in chess. No? There's no saying about it? No. A pawn on the seventh rank is equal to a rook. Is equivalent to a rook. I mean, it's a saying, so you don't believe it. But yeah, it makes sense here. Yeah. Now what's funny is this guy ain't no good. Look at that guy. If only he could move back to F7, then this guy's pretty good. These guys, what are they doing? Not much. Rufus and Doofus. Yeah, Rufus and Doofus. Okay, so Bishop F4, obviously. And Karpov's like, oh, where's that bishop going? I interesting, indeed. Probably everybody expected D6. And Black would sack his bishop, and then he'd have to sack his rook, and we'd have some rook and pawn end game. And Karpov's like, Where, where's that bishop going? And Karpov's like, no talking. And he's like, world champion, 82. Sorry. 
Yeah. AD2 is a world champion. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do on G3? Mm. So you guys would be in a big hurry to play D6, D7. Why are you in a hurry? What's black going to do? Nothing. Yeah, so G3. I can't make the Vishwa nothing joke. It's 82. A non no good in 82. Uh, probably like 1800. Yeah, terrible. Well, he nah, he's probably better than 1800. I thought he was a GM in like 89. Well, this is 82. Yeah, so like he can't be that bad. Oh, wait, that's seven years. Well, yeah. yeah. Now, he was probably like 2000. Yeah, I was 2082. Okay, Bishop, B, Bishop C7. King C2. Once again, move your king up in the ending. If you have mate in one, can win a queen with check or move your king up in the ending, which do you do? What? Correct. Yeah. Move your king up in the end game. All of you would go here. All of you. Is is black gonna do something about that? Can't. No. So king c2, move that king up. Okay, b5. Now the king can't move up. Hubner's mean. He's like, no, you're not moving your king up. Knight takes pawn check because I'll play this when I feel like it, but I'm gonna steal a pawn first. Yeah, and then he's gonna go back and then do it. But he has the h pawn gone. Man, Karpov has passed pawns everywhere. Crazy. So Karpov sacrificing a rook and just like, your rook up, I don't care, because that's the rook that he's up. Boo! Now, if that rook was here, then he'd care a little bit. Yeah. That's serious, right? Yeah. You know which Chinese player doesn't like this? Anybody? <sighs> I made this joke for two weeks. You still don't know. Boo! Oh, boo, 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 you. Yeah, Zhang Chi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I pronounced it wrong, but be quiet at home. You can't pronounce it either. Okay. There's a little, you know, what's her name? Uh, not Heidi. Who's the girl who's good? Uh, hold on. Here, carry the one plus tax. Evelyn. Yeah, Evelyn pronounced, she's like, what, seven? Yeah, she pronounces the Chinese names. And I, I, can't re I can't repeat. She's like, oh, you mean boo. And then she says the name right. And I'm like, I don't know. It's not even boo. It's B-U, and it's still not pronounced boo. It's like, woo, and then you have to, like, do something. She's like, oh, you mean, and I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's Chinese, so she showed me. Okay. So, rook G8, finally, black activates his rook. Rawr, D6. There's no rook on E8. Bishop A5 attacking the rook, the rook. and he moved his rook. Man, and you know what I say when I see these pawns? The truth hurts. Wow, those are some good pawns. When's the last time you were playing and your pawn didn't resign and you had those pawns? Those are some good pawns. I drew in a position like this. You were white? Yes. What? You didn't get two queens? No. Were you winning? Yeah, I messed it up. I got the d6 pawn. And you still drew? Yeah. Yeah, it's harsh. Okay. So rook g5 attacking the knight. Rook takes f6 defending the knight. Man, he's got 5,000 pawns for a rook. Rook takes h5. d7. Ow. This is good because if they switch colors, then Huber can set up quickly. The pawns are in the right place. Rook h2, knight e3. See how the pawns attacked? You guys would be queening all day. All of you. You wouldn't care about rook takes f2 at all. Karpov's like, no, no, no checking. No, no, nothing. You get nothing. e eight's hard to stop, right? You see how Karpov's not in a hurry? Obviously e8 wins. But he's like, oh, my f-pawn. No, can't have that. What a mean guy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and resigns, obviously. And then plus some crazy number. 17? I don't know. Truly. Yeah, some crazy number. 59. Yeah. No, my 17 is correct. No, That's the stop when it gets to 17. 16? Okay, I'll stop it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that was funny. Did you notice something that I noticed? Like, what do you notice about that? I noticed something, like, for sure. And when I tell you, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's right. Carpool can get the big dad in the end. What, about black, what did you notice that? I showed you like a really long part of the game. What did you notice? Uh, he barely came, like, moved his piece. He didn't move this piece at all. Yeah. He didn't move it once. And we're on move 37. That means you probably lost. Let's move 37 and the rook on A didn't move. That's not good. Yeah, yeah. You were like, but black was a rook up. And I'm like, he was? It's right there. Yeah. Man, Karpov sacking a rook. Okay, good in-game player. Okay. Now, this is really boring. This is what he's known for. This position. These positions are usually draws, and white is squeezing, 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 squeezing. But I think the problem is black played b5. I think if the pawn was here, it's more likely a draw. But now the pawns can get attacked. The bishop can attack. 
This pawn can attack. This pawn's not defended by a pawn. So my knight can get in there. My king can saunter in, you know, more quickly. And obviously white's better because black has an isolated pawn and black's bishop is behind all of these pawns on the same color. Okay, so big advantage to white, whether it's winning, I don't know, but Karpov won pretty easy. He must be lucky. Yeah. Okay, so king f2, shocking. King f7, king e3. It's like they went to school with me. Okay. King e7, b4. What's this called in chess, what he did? It's called something. I almost give you credit for that. These pawns are on white squares, and he doesn't want them to move. Freezing. Freezing. I have another name, but freezing's, that's your name. It's fixing the pawn structure. Okay? And we just got a dog, so I'm thinking about that. Fixing the pawn structure. <laughs> All right. The two people got it. Let me three. Yeah, you'll never get it. Okay, so B4. Now, black doesn't want his pawns here. Black wants to trade all the pawns. And you don't want your pawns stuck on white squares because you have a white square bishop, so it just sits there forever, saying, why can't I move? Now, court can't say that because he's not the world champion. In fact, Karpov's not even the world champion. Nobody can say nothing. Who's the world champion? Still Fisher. Still Fisher. That's right. True, true. Okay, g6. Boo! Stopping knife f5, but putting more pawns on white squares. I don't like it. g4, advancing his majority. Who invented that concept? Close. I'll give you a hint since you have 0% chance. Now you all have a chance. Ready? The third world champion. I had to count. It took me a long time to count to three. <laughs> it's on, what? There you go. Name the first two. So you, we showed that you understood what you were doing. No? You just guessed? No, I, I, knew the th I know the third and all I've done on the third piece. Yeah, so Steinitz was first. Lasker was second. Capablanca third. Who beat Capablanca? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, and then who beat him? And then There's two possible answers. You, Uwe. Right, and the other one is he died. Because yeah. he died as world champion. So Irva beat him, then he beat Irva, and then, and then he died. Then there was no world champion. And then, you had then they had a tournament. A quadruple round robin, or even more. I think it was six games. It was crazy. And who won that tournament? They charge him double next time. A guy who is dead, who is never world champion. That's the guy you said. I mean, he's a chess player, so that's good. No, he was, he's never world champion, and he was dead at that point. Who, who was world champion after Aliakin died and they had a tournament? Who won that tournament? I'll give you a hint. His picture's in there and you never know who it is. Oh, there you go. Now you're, oh, the Popovic. Ah, yeah, Bob, yeah Popovic, he was good. Okay, G4. And so Capablanca said, advance your majority. So white has three pawns to two. So let's get a queen. Okay. And also it protects F5 so black can never go to F5. Knight D7. The knight's going to C4. There's no stopping it. F4, stopping it. Okay. And you could, you can't play knight e5. You could play knight b6. Knight, knight f8. Boo! Not the Chinese guy. Just not too passive. G5. Once again, fixing. These pawns will be on white squares forever. This bishop will be more impotent than a Nevada boxing commissioner. No? Well, I stole that joke. Zero. What? It's a zero out of four. Yeah, but I stole that joke. Okay, is that Simpsons? I think so. Okay, so now white's got everything. Pawns are all on dark squares, so the white bishop can move. The knight on d4, the king is on e3 instead of e7. White's pushing his majority, and none of black's pawns can move. Can't move anything. And again, it's 73, so Anand's only three years old at this point. It's February. Hey, it's played on Valentine's Day. That's why I love the game so much. I see what you did there. King d6. King F3, with the idea of... Not G4. Not G4, correct, G4. Advance your majority. That F5, etc. Mainly etc. Knight E6, trade pieces. That then on D4 is pretty good. He takes. King back to E3. He could never put his king on D4, because if he ever did, Knight E6 check would drive him away. You agree. Uh -huh. Now there is no knight. So now we put the king on d4. 
Most of you, and you at home, would say, well, I want to play G4. I'd play king of three to play G4. I'll play G4. No, but the pawn. No, this pawn goes to D4. Yeah. The bishop is open. Pass pawn. No, no, now we put the king on D4. And black cries. Yeah. Now, there's a Zugzwan kind of issue. Black played bishop G4. Let's pretend he went here. Pretending's fun. Now, this is funny because black has a passed pawn and white has no passed pawns. But white's winning. Yeah, but my king's on the fourth rank, and your king's on the third rank, and it's your move. If it wasn't, I would go here. In fact, would I win that? Oh, I have A3 also. Wow. I have all these tempo moves. I'm so good. Well, he is. Yeah, he has a tempo move here. He has a tempo move here. So black sends zooks along everywhere. Yeah. Which way do you want to move? I was thinking if white's pawn was on g3, black could do this. And then I was like, oh, he plays a3. It doesn't matter. So he wins by 7,000 tempi. Okay, so bishop g4. Bishop to d3. King to d4. Man, the truth hurts. This is the worst thing I've ever seen because I'm really high rated. Mm -hmm. So you guys are like, yeah, I probably draw equal pawns. And I'm like, oh, no, everything is good for white. Everything's bad for black. I'm, like, so upset. Like, black can't move. Black can't move anything. Black can never move anything. And white can win on every side of the board. King c5 to b6. King e5 to f6. Push his pawns. And now, black actually can't move. You can't move your king. You can't let my king come in. You can't move a pawn. This reminds me of what great Fisher endgame? Awesome. Close. Fisher Feingold. What year? Before 2002. Correct. 1963. That was, was my dad, it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. Bishop and Pawn Endgame, very famous. I've shown it many times. No. Yeah. Okay, so Bishop G4, Bishop C2, he wants to go here and take the pawn. I have a question. I have an answer. So you said before Bishop G4 that black couldn't do anything. So yeah. Why is Bishop G4 so defeated for black? No, I mean, he can't do anything that he wants to do. Oh, he just waits for white to win. Oh, right. No, he moves bishop back and forth and loses. Right, yeah. okay. If white can't break through, then maybe he'll draw. Okay. That's definitely Yeah. Right. Now, I have a winning idea. I haven't seen the end of this game, but I have a winning idea. I'll play bishop b3 attacking the pawn. You'll play bishop e6. Then I'll play g4. If you take on g4, I'll take on d5. Then I'll be like, hmm, which pawn should I win? Bishop g8, h7, bishop b7, a6. If you don't take my pawn, I'll play f5 and do the same thing. And probably he won some easier way. but Yeah, he's just teasing him. Oh, man, that's a mean move. Oh. Yeah, so this position is Zugzwang. This is a really nice Zugzwang position. You can't move any of the pawns. You all agree, right? You know the en passant rule? Okay, good. Then otherwise, okay. And then if the bishop goes this way, you're hanging the pawn. If the bishop goes and defends the pawn, bishop g4 is winning. Man, the truth hurts. Still can't move. Yeah. Yeah, now I go here, and I go here. Rawr. I go here. Yeah. So, plus nine? Plus ten. What, even better than me? Man, the computer gets it, too. It's like, wow, even material, but I resign. Yeah. Yeah, so here Hort resigned. Now, my good friend Wes Berger, who Karen knows, right? So Hort, who you've never heard of, any of you, well, maybe Karen has, maybe, no, maybe, and then the rest of you, no hope. Vlastimil Hort was top 10 in the world. That's why he's playing Karpov, not because he's some joke, right? Hort still plays chess, old school chess. He plays in like old guys tournaments. He's in the 70s. And uh, my friend Wes, who's a chess player, bridge player, golfer, golfer. Um, he played Hort in the 70s when Hort was at his peak, and my friend Wes beat him. And Hort was like 10th in the world, and Wes beat him with black. Yeah, Wes was good at chess. Yeah. Was. Okay, and then you see how it's no good. Yeah. Okay, whenever people realize that Wes Berger, my friend, beat Hort, they think it's Carl Berger. If you know who Carl Berger is, you should be shaking your head at home. Who's Carl Berger? Right, that's correct. Yeah, very good. Yeah. <laughs> we can't speak ill of the dead, so I got nothing to say. Okay. He, he was an IM because he had money. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. How do you get the money? 
What? He's a doctor. Yeah. yeah. So let's say you went to a norm tournament and you offered your opponents money and they lost to you. Then you could become an IM. Oh. Okay. Enough said. <laughs> All right. Now here, this is one of the things I'm maddest about, which is everything. But this is in particular. Everybody in the world is like, opposite color bishops is a draw. And somehow they move their arms like this. Okay. Opposite color bishops means nothing. I'm mad. It could be you're winning easily. It could be a draw. It could be anything. Now, when there's rooks on the board, I have a rule. Feingold rule. When it's opposite colored bishops and there's a rook on the board, you always win. That's my rule. When there's no rooks on the board, you have drawing chances. Right? Now, here, it's the world's worst pawn structure. They both got a prize. Now, unfortunately, only one of you has heard of Robert Byrne. Who is it? The guy who fished with you. No, that was so you never heard it? He beat both of them in famous games. Uh, Donald Byrne's the one you know. Robert Byrne's the better one. The one you're talking about is 1956, where he sacks his queen. The game. Yeah, that's the game it's of the century. It's the game of the century. Yeah. It's not the immortal game. Not immortal game is something else. Yeah. Okay, Robert Byrne was much better, and they were brothers. Robert Byrne was a grandmaster and a candidate. He was like the best player in the U.S. except for Fisher. Mm -hmm. And Donald Byrne was an I.M. So yeah. anyway, Robert Byrne was good, and there's a famous picture of him playing tennis with Spassky. He played a match with Spassky for a world championship, you know, candidates, you know, call it. And then they played tennis in between their matches. Like they play, draw, then they go play tennis. They like tennis. What are you going to do? Okay. So, and Robert Byrne, as you all know, you should know, for 25 years or more, wrote the chess column for the New York Times. In the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. No? No. But you heard of the New York Times. No. Ugh. Okay. Everything's fake. I know you. It was it was fake too because he wrote he put a game that I lost and I didn't play it. So it is fake news and that was my dad's game. I'm like that wasn't me. That was my. Dad. They never corrected it. You can still correct it. In New York Times. Go back to 1992 August. That's when it was. And my dad lost to John Fedorowitz and they put that I lost to John Fedorowitz. Oh, and I said no, that was my dad and they never corrected it. So you can just still time New York Times. You can still correct it. Okay. So here, obviously, white's better for several reasons. Can somebody give me the reasons? Uh, no, nobody has any reasons. Black has three pawn islands, but uh, he has two double pawn islands, and then h6 pawn can easily be attacked, but can be defended, and white can maybe queen. Okay. okay, can somebody give me a real reason, now that we had that preamble? Yeah, horrible. Yeah, <laughs> that's worse than the actual preamble. But I'll give you credit for being right if you can quote the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. Keep singing. Keep going. That's it. In order to, no. Yeah, he's doing good. Yeah. In order to... Form. Wait, what's the... Form. A more perfect union. Continue. Establish tranquility. No, no, they establish justice. They don't establish tranquility. Justice and tranquility. Yeah. Provide for the common defense. Promote the general welfare. Yeah. And secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this double rook and bishop ending as winning for white. I think that was the end of it. I was learning chess in school. I don't know. Now, these are the real reasons. Okay. Boo! That guy can't move at all. Ah, <sighs> what a good bishop. And see this rook? Boo! These rooks are pretty good. And as you pointed out correctly, lots of weak pawns for black. Right? Yeah. So this pawn's not dangerous because I stopped it. I stopped it on the fifth rank. You stopped my pawn on the seventh rank. Seventh rank is better than the fifth rank. I would say the biggest advantage is of the bishops. I think if, like, your bishop was here, you know, somewhere, yeah, okay, maybe you can draw. Here? you got to activate your pieces. In rook and pawn innings where there's only a rook on the board, you can't put your rook on the first rank and defend and do this. Unless you're playing me, then you can do it. You have to activate your rook. This is an active piece. These pieces are not active, and white's pieces are all good. So white's better. Rook f2, threatening a pawn. f5, defending the pawn. Solid. h5, doing what you said. h6 pawn, no good. Right? Okay. Rook c3, check. Notice these are on dark squares, so that's annoying. Right? Check. A4, advancing his majority. Pawns over there, let's move them. Not really a majority, that's close. Yeah. And now black has to move. Good luck. 
Instead of H4, is there anything wrong with rook? Oh, instead of A4. Is oh, A4. Wrong? Is there anything wrong with rook to H3? That's what I... It's legal. What's your point? I mean, you're, you're hitting the H pawns. Right. Well, I could defend it, rook f4, I could play bishop h6, check and bishop g5. Yeah. Did you have a follow-up if I defended it? Like rook f4, yeah. a4, pawn's good on a4 because I'm going to checkmate you. See, if your king starts coming up, then you get mated everywhere because I stop king b5. Okay, and I gain space, so you can't play b5 anymore. You can't move anything. Karpov's mean. Got five pawns, can't move any of them. Here he could play b5 at some point, but never. Rawr. He can't move anything. Terrible. Okay, rook f4 as predicted. a5. Rawr. Takes. Now he's going to attack the king. The black king has no defense. Rook g4. Rook a3. Man, here comes the shack attack. Threatening. Rook check. And rook c3 check. Yeah, then the bishop on f8 is not too good. Yeah. And you get mated. Man, he started a mating attack because these pieces can't move. Yeah. King c7, rook b5 with the idea of rook a7 or rook c3 check. Check. Always play. King b1. King b1. Okay, and white traded rooks, right? No. That's actually really bad. What do you think? You speak for the class? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Do you want to undouble these pawns and let the pawn go forward? No. 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 Rook a7 with subtle threats. Yeah. How do we stop that? Not rook b8. I don't know what he did, but rook b8 to play bishop d5. That seems like a temporary measure. Huh. Yeah. yeah. The truth hurts. Yeah. Now, as you noticed in every ending, because you were noticing stuff, I need Eddie Murphy here with his look at the camera. You know what I'm talking about? The Eddie Murphy look at the camera? You do? Yeah, yeah he's... Yeah. So, in every game, Karpov had something good going. Like he had a pass C pawn, he had this, he had that. Then he always got something else. You guys were like, ooh, this is a good advanced pass pawn. I'll bet you Karpov played F7, F8 every move. Then he never did any of that. He's like, now I'm going to play over here. Then when you're looking over there, then I'm going to go over here. Right? Karpov did that every game. He opened up a second front. He won on the other side of the board. As Karpov would like to say, when somebody said, why didn't you mate him? When he had a mating attack, he said, I won on that side of the board, and I'm going to win on that side of the board. And he did. Yeah. So he won on the king's side. Now he's going to win on the queen's side. Rook b8, bishop d5, as I predicted. Check. Karpov played the best move. Man, now that's a safe king. That's a safe king. Rook f1, rawr. Bishop e6, rawr. Mm -hmm. And now the game ends in a very funny way. He still checkmates him. Man, tooth hurts. But why checkmated black this game? Rook where? D7. That's right. Yeah. Now you have to play king c8, but you can't play king c8 because I play rook check on h7 and take an h file. And mate you and queen. So you play king e8. Not rook c7. Not rook c7, correct. Yeah. I just saw this like three days ago. It was rook and bishop versus rook. It was in one of those blitz or rapid tournaments they just had in Saudi Arabia. And the computer said, draw, 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 draw. Then I moved like 47. When the guy's moving in one second, he blundered and got mated. And they're like 2,700. But yeah, one second, what are you going to do? Right? And it, got, it was like this. It was the rook and bishop made like this because it's rook and bishop versus rook. Yeah. So whose king is safe? Not black. White's king's. I've never seen such a safe king. Yeah. Because he played a4 and he got his king safe and attacked the black king. Is it almost as safe as the king that was on a5? Yeah. Wait. Yeah, that's also true. Yeah. So just brilliant play by Karpov. That's why he had big reputation as a great endgame player. And Karpov, unlike a lot of other people, if the computer said equal or slightly better, he played and played and played like our current world champion. That was a, I give that one away. Yeah, Magnus is known to do that. Computer says equal and he wins in 80 moves. Right. And they say it's Karpov-like. 
He's sort of like Karpov minus, but you know, he's okay, Magnus, but minus. Now, Magnus will be a good player one day when he knows when his opponent's in check. <laughs> right? And he was going to come to the camp here, but I told him what group he would be in. He's like, no. Wait, what's no. this snub? You don't know what happened in Carlson and Arkiev three days ago? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, he checked his opponent. His opponent checked him. He moved his king. What? That's the illegal move. No, but I mean, you can't check your opponent with your rook next to his king. It wasn't like, you know. When he, when he checked him, he knew he checked him. Then when he got checked, he's like, oh, I'm in check. Okay, I forgot what I did. I'm like, well, Karpov's not doing that. Karpov knows when he's in check. Damn. Maybe not Kasparov, but Karpov. Right? Yeah. Any questions? Do you know who Gene Wilder is? Gene Wilder? No. What would Gene Wilder say now? Terrible. You don't watch all my lectures? You, just, you don't do nothing. You just, you just see movies all night? Terrible. All right. As Gene Wilder would say, Karen... Very good.